welcome to the Coon Hunting University podcast, where we'll discuss all things coon hounds, from competition hunting to pleasure hunting with family and friends. I'm your host, Alan Bridges, and we'll take an in-depth look at our hounds from the welcome box to the winter circle and all the stops in between. So grab your notebooks and your pencils because class is in session. Coonhunting University is brought to you by Superior Hunting Lights. Superior, step up to the max. Use discount code CHU Podcast at checkout on nighthunters.com. Conkey's Outdoors, hunting and hound supply store. We stand behind Conkey's and is the only hunting supply store that we personally recommend here at Coon Hunting University. You can find out more at conkeysoutdoors.com or find them on Facebook, Conkey's Outdoors, and give them a like. And GNR Cedar Dog Boxes. They make a high quality cedar dog box at a great, affordable price. If you're in the market for a new dog box, reach out to Gavin at 615-962-5266. Hey, y'all. I'm really excited to bring you an interview with MC Blackman today. The reason you're hearing from me right off the bat is because when we sat down, MC just started telling his stories, and I decided the best thing for me to do was sit down and listen. I figured I could explain a few things before we start the interview MC is uh, 87 years old, and he's been coon hunting most all his life. He was drafted by the Army, and he was stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where he met Erwin Massengill, and they started the Noose River Dog. That line of dogs produced Michigan Swamp Rooster. MC's owned over 70 Grand Knight champions and several world champions of breed. In 1992, he owned a dog called Grand Knight Champion Noose River Red Queen, and she was the NKC World Champion that year. He's owned a dog called Wolf Creek Rolling Rock that was on the UKC Current and Historical Reproducers list. And he's just full of stories. I want to say a special thanks to Kelly Rainey for setting the interview up with MC. It was just a wonderful visit, and hopefully I'll be able to go back and talk with him again one day. So without any further ado, here's Mr. M.C. Blackman and Kelly Rainey. Grew up with that kind of family around me all my life and got through high school, uh, a little college. I went to Susan Moore High School for uh, assistant coach and math teacher and uh, 23 years old, and the Army drafted me. And I was lucky enough to wind up at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and and my buddy was, and his family were hunters, and we coon hunted every time we could, and that was pretty often. And when I got out of the Army, I, I was given half of a business because of a Man, uh, I owned a store there, and was, he had a nephew that was a good friend of mine, and he was uh, practically blind. And after I got out of that, I was hired to, by the old Jim Dandy Company to represent them at hunts, mostly bird dog, coon dog, foxhound, beagles. But later on, I worked a lot of AKC dog shows, and I, uh, because I had the time and the inclination to do it, I wound up coon hunting just nearly overnight. But even before I started this, I had to hunt, coon hunting had been my thing, and I really, uh, I'm not real proud of this, but I, one time we hunted two and a half years and didn't miss a night. If it was snowing and rain, we sat there and wait for it to quit. And uh, I just fell in love with it. And then uh, I guess I was in my late 20s. I went to the first coon, big coon hunt when I went to work for Jim Dandy Company. And I uh, back then you could hunt great dogs 
and I was hunting a great dog, and uh, the world champion was there. He was a walker dog. I think this was a he was 61, I believe, champion. And I drew him. They put him in the cast because it was a three-day championship. And, and uh, I didn't know any better. I just had a pretty good dog. And, and I, I won that hunt. I know one of the professional handlers in there and uh, at the end of the hunt just a few minutes ago, we turned loose and he said, my dog opened and I struck him and he said, big boy, you've been lucky all night long. Uh, but <clears throat> you're fixing to get beat right here. Well, they trailed around a little bit and come back by us and his dog treating the hole. Mine went about a hundred yards and treated a coon and I won that championship and then went night hunt crazy. And uh, then for probably the next 40 years, I represent the company and I, I went to more coon hunts than anything, but I did go to the big bird dog trials and the other trials and even made KC dog shows. But, um, during that period of time, uh, we were trying to have the best, and uh, I think in 19, in about 1965, I guess, me and Earl Massengill bought a dog called Beach River Sputnik, and uh, we bred him about 40 times. He went up a tree, we were getting ready to go to the world hunt, broke his back, but we bred him artificially about 40 times, I believe, and from him come a dog called Dooley. And um, and then Dooley, too. Dooley True was, uh, old Dooley was a real coon hound. Dooley, too, was same type dog, but a dog that I never seen go Never saw him leave a tree, right, wrong, or indifferent. He was there. And incidentally, he was the sire of the best coon dog I ever hunted with. And uh, from that, uh, I went back in 1975 to uh, Jim Dandy Company as manager of the professional service division. And had the opportunity then to see a lot of things. At that time, we had a kennel. Uh, actually, had about three kennels. I learned a lot about um, how to feed a dog and uh, the habits that a dog has eaten. And uh, that's too. That's another story. But anyway, uh, during that period of time, I owned or co-owned. Uh, about 72 Grand Knight champions. Out of them, uh, one of them was a world champion. And six breed world champions. And my uh, success and theory on that was that if I hunted three times, a dog better win two of them and uh, look pretty good on the other one. Or I didn't keep him. I didn't never get in love with one, and uh, one of the best advices I ever had, and, I, and for anybody, I asked my daddy one time when I was seventeen year old about a dog, and he says, "Son, you know more about a dog now than I ever knew, and don't take advice from anybody if they're not somebody that has more experience or better." At pretty good advice for anything but during that period of time I, I met a lot of friends uh, sold a lot of dog food and um, finally wound up uh, I guess seven or eight years ago uh, bad hearing bad eyesight and some other problems and Plus that I 
trying to make up a little bit of time with my wife and grandchildren at, at missed and Spent a lot of time with the church. Been a deacon for probably 20 years, or more than that, 30 years. And, uh, I just enjoy the sport of living, uh, the sport of coon hunting. Uh, unfortunately, I, because of super highways, cost, and a lot of other things, country just growing up, I, I, I'm. Uh, wondering how it'll survive but I've seen other st I've seen bird dogs that used to require thousands of acres run in a short period of time and they have have adjusted uh, foxhounds are running in pens and they've adjusted maybe we'll find a way to do that with coon dogs but anyhow uh, if you want to win there's two or three things you remember, you don't get in love with them. Uh, they can either win or not. They better win with me. They better win two out of three casts, and I'd rather they win all three. But uh, believe it or not, they're just some unlucky dogs like they are unlucky anything else. But I, uh, I pray that this sport will survive and uh, there's a lot of friendship to be made, and a lot of uh, and there's a lot of things about the sport that uh, teaches a man a lot of things. You learn how to get along with people. You learn how to win. You learn how to lose. And I just uh, pray that the sport will continue, and it will. I. Uh, Right now, during this period of time, is uh, I, I do think that the digital equipment and stuff we've got will replace the magazines. It's hard to even contact the old magazines that I advertise a lot of dogs in. Uh, things are changing. Uh, the biggest criticism I ever had of dogs was they hunt too deep. Well, they didn't. They didn't get too deep for me, and especially as we've got some equipment to track them with. But uh, some of the later dogs that I've got, 15 generations, came from a, an old blue female that my uncle bought, him and Elmo Lofton, and they, they hunted, Elmo Lofton hunted every night, and uh, Nobody knew her background or anything. She just came to them, and she was the brokest dog I ever saw. Coons were very thin back in the late 50s and things in Alabama, especially North Alabama. Now then, uh, one of the things that I found out breeding dogs, one of the best females ever on was bred to a world champion on the litter was the sorriest litter I ever had. And I began to see that uh, keeping something in the family that you know something about uh, is the best way to go to keep good dogs. Outbreeding is an old, is an old pale because from experience I found out that uh, the closer you can stay to it, I've even seen some, I even know where there's a good stud dog that's a brother-sister mating. And uh, when I was a kid coming up, that was a no-no. But uh, genetics, and people studies that have gotten a lot smarter about it. You could have the best female in the world and one of them, on both sides, but if, if they not, uh, if they don't coordinate, you're gonna get the wrong genes over time. And I, I do believe in that. And I, uh, I just wish that. Uh, we'd, uh, well, I wish for the days when we could hunt anywhere we wanted to and nobody cared. But don't we all? This is a real problem right now finding a place to go and 
lot of people are moving out of town and got three acres and don't you and 300 miles of that. But I, I pray that this sport will survive and it's been a big part of my life and a life I don't regret. Are you in the market for a new dog box and just don't know which one to get? That's where I encourage you to go check out GNR Cedar Dog Boxes, especially if you're wanting something different. GNR Cedar Dog Box was established in 2016 when two avid hunters wanted a dog box that was affordable and great looking at that. They provide a high quality, handmade, lightweight box to the customers. They take pride in the fact that their boxes are fully cedar, which will last a lifetime in all types of weather conditions. Cedar also ensures your hounds stay a little warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. You can find out more about GNR Cedar Dog Boxes on Facebook. G- find them at GNR Cedar Dog Boxes or give them a call at 615-962-5266. They're located in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, USA. Another good thing to remember is, though, you, I don't care, you may live to be a hundred, but if the Lord don't come back, you're going to die. And uh, one of those places, they say there's no sorrow and no heartaches and no uh, uh, joy all the time. The other one is pretty hot. And that uh, that should be number one in your life. Hasn't always been with me. I was about 56 years old before. I knew God from the time I could walk because of my parents, but I didn't do anything about it much till I, I think I was about 56 years old before I started trying to do right. So that's a that's a little thing that uh, is probably more important than anything else I could say. What else you want? Well, Mr. Blackman, uh, you have been a legend in this sport for decades. Um, I guess, tell us about, you want a world hunt with a dog. What, what was she? How was she bred? Well, we, we want a world hunt with, uh, with Queen outright, uh, News River. We called her by Irwin's. We kept his name because at that time he was, but the News River Red Queen was the best dog I ever hunted. And that includes more world champions than I can talk about. And um, I, I made it a point to go with the best hat dogs that I could find. But all in all, she was the best coon dog I ever hunted with. I couldn't even come in to tell you how many that's been over the years because during those 60 years uh, I, uh, I hunted with a different dog almost every night except I drew a lot of the same dogs in competition. Mm-hmm. But I uh, I do read them. <clears throat> All during this period of time, I've, I've kept a female, especially out of the old blue bitch I was talking about, and a dog called Toby. He was a high tan looking dog, not registered. But we hunted in the mountains at that time, and there's a lot of hollers running off from a mountain if you're near the top, and he treats so hard and so loud until you go up the wrong holler a lot of times trying to get to him. And Life of them come a great dog, um, and I bred and have kept that line. Uh, the last bitch I had here, fifteen generations back, still had that same. Which female dogs. was that? We just called her. Uh, we just we just called her Blue. She was just a blue colored female, mm-hmm. and uh, we knew nothing about her background or anything, but. She's the widest hunter I ever saw. Uh, we turned her loose a lot of times, eight miles, and she had to come by a river that she didn't like to cross. 
and I've picked her up there a lot of times. Well, those, those in those days when we didn't when we didn't have tracking equipment, uh, she'd come in about nine o'clock every day, and you could hunt her all you wanted to, and uh, she just seemed to never give out. But in daytime, she rested, and uh, this Toby, uh, he, he was a he was a trashy dog. He almost. They almost broke him uh, from hunting because they're trying to break him off off game. But he was a tree dog, like you know, he's always been my standard. He sat back in the tree two uh, two or three feet on his uh, on his bud, and he treed unbelievably loud and clear. And uh, I kept some of that in there. Yeah, well, let's fast forward 15 generations to the, the last female you had that went back to her. Which one was that? The the, the, the uh, blue female that I was talking about in the 50s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's... let's and my uh, uncle owned her, and, and uh, I never did own her, but I hunted with her a lot. Okay, did, and so you kept it, kept that line for 15 generations, and then what did you end up with that, on this end of it? Well, Blue Boy was out of that line, and uh, I believe, I believe out of uh, old, out of Dooley, mm-hmm. he spread to this female, and we just sort of intermingled it for a, a long way back. But one of the real outcrosses I had, I thought, was. Uh, uh, Rock. And that would have been Wolf Creek Rolling Rock. Wolf Creek Rolling Rock. But I, looking at a pedigree, he, he had a uh, old blue boy in his generation about eight, about eight generations back, or six generations back. So I just sort of stayed in that. And I've, I've always looked for something outstanding in a dog with some extra strength or extra especially good noses. Uh, well, tell me I had a dog right. called Rocky Top. Was it Rocky Top Spec? One time, and a lot, a lot of people accused him of babbling, but he always wound up with it. He just had the best nose of any dog mm-hmm. that it was around. And I, I've, I've looked for the dogs I've left look for the breed over the years, especially if they wasn't right in the line with something that was outstanding. Yeah. Outstanding hunter, good nose. Uh, I tried to stay away from mean dogs. Uh, you breed two mean good dogs together, you're going to get two mean dogs. Yes. So tell me about Rolling Rock. Well, Rolling Rock... Uh, First time I saw him was Bobby Langford was hunting him, and uh, when he uh, first time I was with him, I heard him open. I told Bobby, I, I said, "What about it, Bobby?" He said, "He's got a good mouth, don't he?" I said, "No, he's got the best I, one of the best I've ever heard. I've heard one I think is good, but he wasn't as pretty, and uh, you either." And uh, I hunted with the dog about. 25 times and Bobby was going to trade some dog he had for him and I told him that I wanted that dog because he he looked like a hound even though he wasn't a great show dog. He was a good looking dog. He had to, at least either the best or next to the best dog I ever heard bark. Uh we had him. We have hunted him as much as forty straight nights, and we still got to pull his head off the ground to keep him from trying to strike another coon. Uh, he was a uh, one of the things I never figured out about him was that he was an ordinary tree dog for about three minutes, and then he just kept picking it up and picking it up, and he'd finally be treeing so hard you couldn't couldn't hardly believe it. Uh, 
he got bred with uh, the Langfords were hunting him, and they bred some females to him over there. And uh, we begin to see real quick that he was a especially dominant in mouth, but it was dominant in many other things. He was a great sire. Been in the uh, Hall of what? What is the uh, the, the UKC reproducers list? Right, he's been, he's been on that list. Uh, well, for 20 years now, I guess. Um, I just, I just liked the dog, and uh, at the time it, I bought him, I didn't even know what he was. I, I didn't know if he had papers. Bo Langford was hunting, and, and he'd won two or three world hunts, and one of the best young, he started hunting about 10 years old, one of the best handlers I ever saw, and he said, well, I don't know if he's a good night hunt dog and I said I don't care if he never wins nothing he's the kind of dog I want to hunt myself I like I hear him I know what he's doing and I just like this dog and uh, then when I got him I discovered he had been a grand night champion since he was less than two years old and how old was Rock when you wound up with him I I think he was about close to four I'm not dead sure what his age was at that time. The, the man that owned him either, I've forgotten, but the reason we were able to get him, the man that had bought him and paid a dear price for him, was had cancer, and he died pretty shortly after that. But I, uh, I loved the dog. I loved everything about him. But the best all around Best coon dog ever hunted was New Silver Red Queen. Mm -hmm. Queen uh, won a world hunt. She won the three hunts at Georgia with over four, over 500 dogs. She won Alabama State with that many. She won over 200 casts in, in, in competition and winning at least 85 or 90 percent of those casts. Mean dogs couldn't run. She just had everything. A mean dog couldn't run her off. She didn't care if dogs were with her. There wasn't with her. It didn't make her no difference. Uh, the only criticism I ever heard from her was that she just goes too far. And in those days, I didn't worry about how far they went. And, uh, she went where the coons were. <laughs> she went to find one. She found one. She's in the Alabama Hall of Fame now, and I think the Georgia Hall of Fame. And she needs to be in any Hall of Fame right now. There's, there's, I don't know of any dog that's got a record that good. That's now, Mercer's Ball, had won three world hunts, but he was actually only in about 64 casts. Mm -hmm. She was doing it every weekend. Uh, Queen was, she was hunted in a competition hunt. From the time we got her and started night hunting her, she was in one cast every week. And sometimes it, it'd be a world hunt. She'd be hunting three nights a week. And that, and she went in those casts. She, uh, uh, she bricked this house here. There's a reason we didn't win two more world hunts with her. But... Uh, she is a uh, dog that uh, I remember the best. I know we had good ones though, all down the line. I didn't keep them. Well, you were telling me in your barn a while ago about uh, you being in the army and near Fort Bragg, and you and you got together with Irwin Massengill, and and y'all had a special dog that y'all went and found. And tell me about how Beach River Sputnik came to be. Conkey's Outdoors knows that keeping up with the latest in hunting technology can be expensive. That's why they are proud to offer amazing financing options from 30 days same as cash to 0% interest for 6, 9, 12, and even 18 months, depending on your credit score and the amount you spend. If you've been eyeballing that new thermal or want to upgrade to the latest in tracking system technology, 
Go find out more on the web at conkeysoutdoors.com or if you're in the Hastings, Florida area, stop by and visit. They'd love to have you. Conkeys Outdoors, houndsmen, helping houndsmen. Well, he, he was owned by Clovis Stanfield, and at that time he and Harold Sisson owned the ACHA registry. And, well, the whole thing, I suppose. And uh, uh, when I, my company sent me up, I, I was hired as a, uh, to go to dog shows. But um, the man was going to be retired in a few years, and they wanted me to get some experience with selling. And uh, I was in charge of some brokers during that period of time while I was up there. And while... Uh, I went to North Carolina. I was hunting Blue Boy, Blackman's Blue Boy, and he uh, uh, well, I hunted with Burl and Massengill a few times. And at that time, he was hunting walkers. But uh, after a few hunts, Blue Boy, he said, uh, "Let's buy the best English dog in America and uh, see what we can do with him." And I said, "Well, if we." Asked a thousand people what's the best English dog, you'll get a thousand names. But uh, Beach River Sputnik is placed second, third in the world hunt. Good looking dog, good mouth, a great hunter. Uh, I think he's the best dog to buy. And at that time, in the early, well, in the middle 60s, we bought him, but paid $2,000 for him. I know one one hunter said, well, the truck my skills brand ain't worth but $100. I said, well, it don't matter. We paid $2,000 for that. I paid half of it, and he did. But uh, after we hunted him about three months, getting him ready to go to the world hunt, he run up a tree and fell down and broke his back. I wanted to put him to sleep. Irwin's wife uh, wanted to see what she could do with him, and... Uh, we bred him artificially about 40 times, and then Dooley came from there, and then Dooley too, and then Rambo, and Rambo was a sire of rooster. And, uh, so you've had a pretty big hand in, in shaping the English breed up until today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but anyhow, I, uh, I just uh, love this. Coon hunt. It's been my life, and I hope we can find a way to survive. At the time I started hunting, the local hunt was 40 and 50 dogs, UKC, and that was the only kennel club at that time. Mm-hmm. And uh, now then, uh, they're lucky to have three cast. Yeah. Yeah. That's... And uh, uh, super highways, more people, land getting cut up. It's taking its toll on places to hunt, and that's probably the biggest hindrance to the sport right now. Well, we got Kelly Rainey sitting right here. How did you and uh, Kelly get together, and and what's Kelly meant to you? Well, Kelly is um, uh, we we just hunted a seems like a million nights together, and we we live close and. Kelly is a lot more knowledgeable about breeds and things. I never tried to keep up with him. He's one of the most knowledgeable people about breeding and how it got there that I know of. And uh, uh, He spent a lot of time in there. And, you know, the world's full of, not just only coon hunters, but the world's full of uh, uh, people, that of talkers. But doers is a different story. People that have actually done it, mm-hmm. and uh, we 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 see that not only in the people that some of the people that we put in the Hall of Fame and dogs we've put there and everything else. It's like politics. Some things get done that way, but uh, we got plenty of people that have walked that can walk the walk, but we've got very few people. That uh, that have done the job and been out there and have put in. I had a lot of people trying to sell me a dog that 
during this period of time. And in talking to them, if they didn't hunt three nights a week, I didn't go look at the dog because he hadn't been hunted enough to suit me. Yes, sir. And did Kelly handle dogs for you? Yes, Kelly's handled a lot of them. And uh, fortunately, some of the better ones are bond in, you know. I don't know what all you've hunted. Top, what all have you hunted? I can't remember. We've had so many, it's hard for me to say. Yep, we're going we're gonna to get Kelly to talk a little bit about all these, right. too. So, Kelly, me and you kind of met over social media, mm-hmm. and we kind of struck up a friendship, even though you're an Auburn Tigers fan. <laughs> Go dogs. <laughs> we can talk about that in jest. You had hunt. You've hunted a lot of dogs for MC, mm-hmm. and so just kind of, kind of go through there and and tell me your story about how you and MC got together and some of the dogs that you've handled for him, and tell me the, about those dogs. Well, I, I guess in in the late eighties, I was just getting into competition hunting. And, you know, back then, I hunted Walker dogs, and I'd win a cast here or there, and and. You know, I'm real competitive, and I wasn't winning enough. And at that time, here in North Alabama, MC and the Lankford boys was just wearing it out. Fortunately, uh, most of the time they were in, you know, night champion cast and grand night champion cast. I could see real quick that, that they was winning. And, you know, of course, growing up in Alabama and being competitive, you know, if a young man wants to uh, – go play college football at that time he'd want to go play for bear bryant mr blackman in my eyes was the bear bryant of uh, coon hunting i had a gentleman that was hunting with me that bought a pup off of mc and it was off a rooster and i believe old meg and it run and treed the first night we carried it I could, my interest really i wanted to be around mc that much more you know the competitive spirit within me I wanted to be around him. And I'd say uh, one of the biggest things that MC taught me was to recognize quality. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, like he said, they fall in love with a dog and they'll hang on to the ones they don't need to hang on to. And he taught me how to recognize quality, not only in the woods as far as hunting ability, but he taught me about confirmation. And as a whole, he taught me about competition hunting. And what it took to win, and you know, you have to learn how to lose as well. Mm-hmm. What was your favorite dogs to hunt? I would have to say uh, a little female that MC acquired from uh, Harrod Pinnell, Cahaba River Bonnie. Back in them days, I think I kept track of it like 20 nights. I think I treated 30, 37 coons with her. What was, other than being accurate? What was some of your favorite attributes about her, and how was she bred? Uh, she was off a of old Meg and and uh, rooster, okay, Michigan Swamp rooster. And what did old Meg go back to? Uh, if I remember correctly, she was off of Rusty, and you know Rusty went on back to Thrasher's Little Buster, and you know uh, some of the Platte Valley stuff way on back there, and Junior breeding stuff okay. like that. All right. So going forward, that was roughly when you were doing that. I think early 2000s when MC bought Bonnie, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, he bought her as a pup and he started her and, you know, she's one of them that came here treeing and I, I realized right out of the gate she was a tree dog. That's the thing. If they ain't tree dogs, they, they Mr. Blackman, we're going to keep them. Mm-hmm. If you don't have tree dog, you don't have nothing. Yeah. That's the, that puts the icing on the cake. So tell me a little bit more about Meg and, Pearl and some of the other dogs that, that, that we've discussed. Well, uh, after he had, well, MC acquired Bonnie and a dog by the name of Cahaba River Levi. He was off Old Meg and Hillbilly Mike, Gamble's Hillbilly Mike. And uh, unfortunately, MC, he wanted to improve the breed and he was looking for that special stud dog. And, and unfortunately, Levi wasn't enough dog for Mr. Black. We messed around and, and uh, Howard owned Little Meg and he bred Little Meg to Rooster. And, you know, that's where some of them puppies kept on coming. 
down down the line, you know, and then there was one off of that cross called Sue, and we had so many dogs. Sue Sue never got carried to town. Sue was bred to top. Top's probably one of the top three tree dogs I've ever heard in my life. Him and Rock is probably two of the loudest tree dogs I ever heard pull a breath. Mm-hmm. Right. You got hooked up with MC. Did you handle Rock and top in the hunts too? Uh, we didn't. We didn't hunt Rock in in the hunts. We was real careful about that because Blackman had recognized what kind of reproducer he was and. And we didn't want to get him killed. But, yes, I did finish Top. Top had been messed up by the previous owner a couple of times. And MC just had an in- inclination to get them kind of dogs that people couldn't finish. And he would fix them. He made it where Top could be finished. Tell me about you were pretty instrumental in getting Mr. Blackman inducted into the, the getting the Lifetime Achievement Award from the English Association. So kind of tell me about that. You know, I told you before I met Mr. Blackman, I, I couldn't win. I you know, hit, hit or miss, hit or miss. And then, of course, when he kind of took me under his wing and we started developing our relationship and we become friends and we made all the hunts and I started winning even before Rock come along. Mm-hmm. I started winning with his dogs and, my level of respect is just, you know, it's very deep for him. I could see what he had done and what he had accomplished in the breed. And then, you know, of course, when Rock come along, it, it just picked up and got that much better. He didn't go into it, but Rock didn't happen overnight. MC had a process that he went through several years before he settled on Rock. He had a goal in mind, and I can't exactly explain it you just have to been there and lived it to know what his requirements were and what the criteria had to be for rock to become the dog that mc would offer at stud we've talked pretty extensively kelly about dogs that have showed up in one of my particular house pedigree so you you keep mentioning maggie and pearl and so i want you to kind of tell me about those well uh the sue female i told you never got to town you know uh she had some real likable qualities about her but we was hunting older dogs title dogs at that time and we could only hunt hunt so many and i think it was accidental breeding with top and and sue that produced pearl Mm -hmm. which is the maggie dog's uh dame in in your dog's pedigree like I said, Top was a pitting me of a tree dog. I don't think I've ever heard maybe one or two more that was loud as him. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know, Rock's right there with him, you know. It seemed like he crossed well over the Sioux female, which brought Maggie and Pearl. Of course, you know, Pearl was bred to Brock, and she produced four Grand Night Champions and three Grand – I mean, four Night Champions and three Grand Night Champions. Mm-hmm. And that was was that the only time she was bred? Uh, we never did breed her to anything but rock, right? Uh, we there was no reason to breed her to anything else. Sure. I mean, we had rock here, and we had to be careful. We would end up with more than we could handle. Well, yeah, it's not hard to do. Yeah. First of all, Mister MC, it's an honor to sit here and talk to you. Tyler Duncan and I wanted to kind of capture. A lot of the wisdom and get a lot of the stories about the coon hunters, our history, you know, the the folks that got us to where we are today, and you definitely fit that bill. Well, the sport of coon hunting, uh, when I come up, was uh, just something that farm boys could do and there wasn't too much else to do and it can it just it really grows on some people especially me it just uh, I did play football and some other sports too but I uh, it was just a passion with me I enjoyed coon hunting just as much but 
Well, I probably enjoyed it more before I ever went to an Idaho. Mm-hmm. But I was looking for a good one then. Mm-hmm. I know one night I, my daddy and I went with my uncles and they supposed to house some real dogs. And the one I'd been hunting, they were slow trailing one way and he just went the other way, you know, and had the coon. And they, they were a little embarrassed because they didn't know enough about it to know they'd been had, you know. And yes. Then the, after that, you know, I got the opportunity to hunt with that old blue bitch and Toby, the, and I saw right quick that there's a huge difference between what we're hunting and what he's hunting. And I quit that. And, uh, if you can't I, beat them, join them. I, I see that with cattle, too. I've, tried, I've done everything I can do to improve them, and I... I I've never seen a, anything as dominant as a bull is with cattle. I guess that old bull up there weighs a ton now. He got too big. Them calves hit the ground about 40, 50 pounds, but they hit the ground grazing. If you got good mamas, feed them. There's a lot of similarities between breeding dogs and breeding cattle. Well, I think that is. I think you... Uh, I don't know why. I guess you're just born with some things of uh, competition, but if I'm going to breed them, I want to breed the best. That's right. That's I, how especially you when you find out how much more they bring. That's right. I'm, I mean, uh, uh, I had a fella tell me one time it didn't, it didn't cost any more to feed a good one. No, it <laughs> don't. And it costs enough to feed one, so you might as well make sure they're a good one. It's just, you know, it's pretty much the same way with dog. Can I tell you, it, you never saw a poor dog here long, did you? No, sir. Uh, they didn't stay long. They, a dog performs a whole lot like what kind of condition he's in. Absolutely. You you can't get $10 worth of gas out of a $2 gas tank. No. <laughs> I hunted old queen in the world hunt after Massengill, a daughter. Irwin uh, got a long time before his old, he's taking people's word and going sitting on the tailgate and uh, these some of these dogs that uh, people tell you about that you got a handler along he'll tell you what they want you to hear you know mm-hmm. some things are so just common sense about some of these things if your motive is to win hunts win night hunts or win anything then you got to be determined to do it and do what it takes to get there that's fine. And certainly keeping a dog in condition. Old Queen, I, they brought her to a world hunt up there and didn't even have her entered, even though she was qualified. And she was sick. And I got, I went and bought some antibiotics and doctored her a couple of days and, and got her to, she wasn't wide open, but she was good and she knew me. And well, I, I won the first two rounds in my world hunt. And the last night I went, I got with two brothers and a buddy that dogs fought all night long and queen was doing that they didn't scratch no dogs or nothing and it's something else about queen that i never saw in another dog about i guess she's about three years old and she'd always been a spurt trier she'd tree like the devil and shut up just a second and go back at it and she come out of heat I was over there, and, and it was just, I mean, it's just like a, it's as steady as it could be. I said, Bobby, what happened to you on that? And he said, I don't know. And about that same time, you, you know, most dogs back then, a lot of them packed and all that. Well, she learned how to go around the bad tree. If it wasn't a coon there, she'd go 100 yards a lot of time and have a coon, you know. And she learned all that. It, during that period of time, Queen, I, I saw Queen, a special dog, but well, Howard Panel and hunted the country where they was mining, you know, and it was just bad. And his little dogs learned how to handle that country, you know, and Queen didn't look so good. Come down to 
I run a hunting store on the side then, and I had a, uh, he come down there and said, I might sell old Queen. I said, yeah. I just sort of dropped it a minute. I said, what do you want for her? He told me it was a little bit more than she was probably worth at that time, and Clint was down there. And I knew how he was. He'd have backed out in a heartbeat. When he told me what he'd do, I happened to have that cash. I ran out, and I just walked over and handed it to him. He said, oh, you ain't got to pay me now. I'll bring her to you. I knew he'd back out. Clint, I said, Clint, you know where he lives? He said, yeah. I said, go get her. He said, I'll bring the dog to you. I said, go get her, Clint. <laughs> and, uh, and then and then it wasn't long, you know, I put her over out of the Langford's. And about a month, that was when it first come out, they called me and said, we got to have a track and call her. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. uh, that's how she come about. The old merchant told me one time that he had a buddy that hunted with him and said he had a real dog. But he liked to climb stooping trees. And it's, he, it just worried that my boy didn't like it at all. He said, I'm going to get rid of that SOB. And the merchant said, what do you want for him? He said, I think he said $400. Of course, this is way back to uh, that dog like him, well, the merchant didn't sell them. They sold for thousands. He said to him, well, I'll just take him. And he said the first night he took him, he treated on his tree and just got up about, he let him get up about where it wouldn't hurt him, but he shocked him. And he hit, he, he come off of that tree and he, he said he never went up another and when he, and Less than two weeks, he sold that dog for ten thousand dollars. <laughs> I was that lucky on some too. I bought some that I bought old Jim for <clears throat> three or four hundred dollars. And this this feller that that's where Blackman Blue Girl owned her, you know. I give him the dog, and me and Irwin he kept telling me what kind of tree dog she was, and we went over there, and God, she was. I said. I told her, I said, you want to kick my butt or you want me to kick yours? And, but anyway, that uh, uh, Jim dog he had, he was about three years old, and they were shooting coons out and selling them. He, they were showing up poor people. And, and Jim had tired. He, when he got a coon, he tired. Well, he told me, he said, I'm getting rid of old Jim. He, he, these hides ain't worth half as much. You, you, know, you can't keep them off of him. Uh, he said, if you try to get the gun away from me, I'll bite you. And uh, his buddy was there, and that night we hadn't treated but one coon. He said, uh, well, no wonder. We've killed 60 coons here. <laughs> Already, but I said, "Well, how many coons did you old Jim?" He said, "God, I guess we shot three hundred coons out to him." And I, I, I bought him cheap. I went with Mister Cobb the next night. And I had him, and he, he treed. And well, I shot that coon out, and I brought, he's the dog I brought from North Carolina with me when I moved back here for, for the company. I had to be close to Birmingham. I should have kept, he was a beautiful dog and a good one, but Jim Shelby, that's the man I bought with Joe from. He 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 had uh, he had more money than he did since, so I sold it to him. I went over to, we were going to buy a beach river Jack and had him over there, and I saw some things about Jack that I didn't like. He'd run a coon up a tree by himself and, hit a lick or two and go on and then tree another. And, but if you had another dog with him, God, he'd tree of one of them. And uh, I didn't like that. I didn't like it at all. And 
he priced the dog at then, which was way off. I believe he priced him to us for twenty five hundred dollars, and then we were at the World Hunt, and he 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 went up to thirty five. About that time, I was down there at the World Championship bird dog thing, and Jim Shelby was shooting horses there, and he told me about. It. The dog and I went with him, and I liked him. I liked him a lot. And I, I said, Jim, if you let me <clears throat> take him home with me. Uh, if he'll do there what he does, I'll buy him. And he said, No, no, I just sell him on the spot. I just find him, and uh, I got plenty of dogs. And uh, but I got up the road and I saw him motion and come back. He said. Take him on with you. I, I know you. I know you'll pay me. So I, I bought him. What I was going to do was run an ad on some of the people that that didn't hadn't, hadn't done just done the talk. They they'd walk the walk. Bobby Langford and his politics. He should have been there, but too quick. Bo died when he was 50, but he, they put him in the Hall of Fame that year. And and, um, and Ricky and him and uh, Masson Gill, uh, John Williams, I, I had several hunt buddies that I wanted to remember and recognize, especially Irwin told his wife I was going to put it in the magazine. Well, I, I, just, I was just going to write an ad and you know, in memory of these people, and uh, and point out the fact that they wasn't just uh, they wasn't just somebody talking English dogs. They somebody who went had been there. Now, Bobby Langford. I don't know anybody had ever put in as many indicts in the woods as he did. Bo was a real handler, and Ricky was a good handler, but not in Bo's class. Bo was a big old boy. And, you know, as well as I do, there's a lot of intimidation in this game, too, and you didn't intimidate him. Every every competition hunter says that you get a lot of 20 and $30 lessons, and, and once you get them, you're not, you don't get so intimidated anymore. And if, he'd, if he hunted as much yeah. as you say he did, he got his lessons early and it didn't get wore off. The, um, all right, a lot of these dogs... There's a lot of reason a lot of them was tree and wrong is because they hunted a lot and they've got stuff up their nose and sinuses. And before he turns the dog loose, he, he's got some kind of saline solution. He squirts in their nose. And these are things that Clinton learned, and he don't tell people, but he mm-hmm. hunted with him enough to. And there's some more tricks that he did that uh, I never had even thought about in all my life, but I didn't. Change the bed and every week never crossed my mind. I know that you don't put them in a wet box and all that, and you keep them dry as you can and as comfortable as you can. But this thing about the nose, <clears throat> he believes that's the reason dogs are treeing wrong so much. Right. But we bred them and do that. I, I know uh, he had, I had an old dog down there, he was hunting. And, Clint was hunting, and he, his kid come along, and he'd give $4,500 for a walker dog. And, and uh, he said, Clint said he didn't go 300 yards to tree, and he said he could have been to the tree over if he wanted to. He said he made three trees like that, and the old dog was hunting went on to the coon. And the kid said, well, that's the difference between a competition dog and a, and a, just, uh, just old coon dog. He said, "Boy, do you know what you're talking about?" He said, "Yeah." He said, "You'd have been scratched at the second tree. I'd have minus you 200 points on the first, one. and on the second one, you'd have been out of the cast." Has nobody ever done that to you? And he said, "No." And he said, when you get to the right place, they'll do it to you. If you ever run to me, you'll, you'll find out. He said, I don't want this cast with a hundred and something points, 175 points. Mm-hmm. You'd have been scratched. 
the uh, but a lot of them, a lot of these boys come up and uh, they just fall in love with that dog that was free up the first tree. Some of the last hunting I did, it got so bad <clears> to <throat> there'd be three dogs just run about like out there and lock up. If you didn't have one, he had better sense. He would too. Mm-hmm. It's it's been an epidemic. <laughs> yeah, it has. I've been tough on a dog too if you need it, but you better do it. The bird dog people taught me this: you better do it when you're not mad and when the right one goes, and you better do it within at least thirty seconds. You better make sure you're right when you do it too. Yes, I sold a man a shock collar one day and I, I warned him I said you know what you're doing now you're running a dog he turned them out and boy they struck wide open they was going and he thought that he saw a fox and he thought they was after it and he said I remember what you said and I just waited a minute and said bam they were treed and had a coon and that goes on too mm-hmm. one of the best young dogs we ever had got run and he'll still tree every coon in the woods, but this man that had him was letting him run loose, and he tree squirrels around in the yard. His wife knew how to use that collar, and she didn't like that. And, and when we got him back, uh, he'd be treeing his guts out, and he'd shut it off and never bark another leg. Finally, Clint got on him so hard they told him what happened. Mm-hmm. And he, I mean, today. He's still doing the same thing. I mean, he was a tree dog out of this world. That electricity will run him. I always said, and this is easier said than done in a lot of cases, but I've always told people, you got to be smarter than the dog. That's right. <laughs> common sense applies everywhere, and that's what's missing in the United States is common sense. Yep. Not intelligence. Common sense. Yes, sir. Tell you somebody else is fixing it out. The people that can build these houses, the ones that can weld, the ones that can fix a car, them type people, they're going to be the highest paid people in America. You know, the joke's out now about the brain surgeon. The toilet went bad and he's having a party and he called a plumber. He, he fixed it, gave him the bill, and he said, Look, I'm a brain surgeon. I don't make this kind of money. And he said, yeah, I was too till I found out where the money was. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. But uh, Go ahead, Kelly. Clint, Clint said they, they're paying $60 an hour for welders now and can't get them. Uh, you know, I mentioned before, you know, MC it, it pounded it in my head about recognizing quality and and he's told me uh, too many times to count he he didn't take joy in getting on a dog you know uh, he just you know it's something that had to be done and i'll give you an example of what happened one night and it was a valuable lesson to me i mentioned that dog it didn't make the cut as a stud dog him and that other dog uh, another dog had treated a possum well, he whoops the one dog and turns around and looks at me and tells me to take the other dog to the truck. So I, I questioned him afterwards. I said, why didn't you whoop the second dog? He said, the second dog's too ignorant for a buck kick in the stick, and he won't be here tomorrow. That's right. Once you see one, you can't do it. Just don't waste your time. Yeah. There's a lot of wisdom in that. I wish I could be more help. I I just uh, I just coon hunting's been my life, you know. And, and I I've been around all kinds of dogs all my life. I judge uh, Bobby Langford was brought one of the first world hunts in here. And I've been around so many. I never judged a bench show in my life, but they insisted I do it. And I put up a black and tan dog. Of course, some show people you, you don't make friends there. I, I, I wouldn't judge. But anyway, I ever one of them. That dog ain't never won nothing. I said, he was the best dog here today. And I'm and I, that's where I saw it. And the end of it, he won every world hunt that year. 
<laughs> well, that's something right there. Well, thank you so much for letting me come over here and sit down and well, talk to you. Well, I'm just It's been my pleasure. I really hope y'all enjoyed that interview as much as I did. If you like what you heard here, go on over to Facebook. Give us a like, at Coon Hunting U. Also, go to Apple Podcasts. Leave us a rating and a review. It really helps us out. And remember, if you need a new hunting light, do not overlook Superior. They make an awesome light, best customer service in the business. Man, their walking light and double red is the brightest I've ever seen. Use coupon code CHU Podcast at checkout at nighthunters.com. You can find the link in the description box below this. Coon Hunting University is a product of Audio Hound Productions. Until next time, y'all have a wonderful day.